try too much. So he says to me, he says, why don't you help me write a eulogy for dad that the rabbi will say? I said, okay, what do you have so far? So, so far he had, let's see, he wrote, father, husband, businessman, and friend to all. I said, well, that's not very encompassing. Uh, so, <laughs> since I w realized I wasn't going to speak, I just poured my heart out in this eulogy that I wrote for the rabbi to say. So, as my brother says he's going to get up and speak, I said, go ahead, maybe I'll speak, maybe I won't. My brother, the sociopath, gets up and reads word for word the eulogy that I wrote oh, yeah. for the rabbi, oh, yeah. expressing oh, my feelings and my emotions because he doesn't have any. <laughs> so, uh, my, my turn to speak, I get up, I do some funny stories, and you know, I want to keep it light. And uh, I did make a mention, I thanked my brother, I said I could have said it better myself, but you said it first. <laughs> So finally, the uh, drug addict, the drug addict brother, it's his turn to speak. Oh. He staggers to his feet. Uh, the two, the other two brothers, help him to the podium. Again, he's flapping. You know, I mean, he could have invented the airplane because he's flapping these crutches, and the rabbi's ducking, and the eternal flame is swinging like a pendulum. And we prop him up on the podium, and he's just looking around, and being the pretend psychiatrist he is, he paraphrases uh, Sigmund Freud, and he says, uh, he says, uh, let me see, what does he say? <laughs> oh, we all know, remember, he said, Freud says we are never really free until our parents die. <laughs> Jaws dropped. You hear them hitting. And my mother said, looked at me, she said, What did he say? I said, Mom, I want you to live a long time because he'll never be free. So they went again downhill from there. We dragged him off the podium and he's swinging the crutches. The rabbi's ducking. We sit him down and there's another speaker who gets up. And while this person is speaking, uh, my, we hear a phone ring, a cell phone, and it is playing the French na national anthem. <laughs> well, we hadn't invited Marcel Marceau, so we know it was my brother's phone because he's from France. So he's rummaging around in his briefcase, and this thing is ringing and ringing. I mean, Charles de Gaulle didn't have the French national anthem played for him that much. And finally, you know, and everything comes to a stop. The speaker stops, the room stops. He picks up the phone. He says, hello? Oh. Yes? And he begins a conversation. And I'm saying, get off the phone. Get off the phone. Get off the phone. He's, okay, wee oui, wee, oui, bye bye, de de <laughs> So he finishes the call, we start up. But um, one of the things that uh, I'd ask, because my father, uh, again, this is off topic, because Vicky mentioned I was, I did the pilot for Love Boat. I was the original Gopher Smith, and I got booked on another show, and they went back and did a second pilot. We couldn't, I couldn't do it. But my father, for 12 years that that show was on, told people, I was Gopher Smith. <laughs> and they would look at him like he was fucking crazy. <laughs> and we were sitting at a Japanese uh, place, and there was uh, an African-American couple he was sitting next to. It was like uh, Benny Hanna's. And uh, I'm sitting on the other side, and he looks over at the guy. He says, see that, my son? That's Gopher Smith. That's Gopher. <laughs> and the guy looks at him and he says, that ain't Gopher. I thought this is no shh. It's Gopher. It's Gopher Smith. He looks more Jewish in person. That's him. So for 12 years, my father had this fantasy and told people that was me, and it wasn't me, and uh, that was part of his thing. So, so part of uh, so growing up, when I would say emotionally abused because I was Cinderella, my two brothers were totally enabled financially, mm -hmm. and since I wanted to be an actor and not go to work for my father. Uh, not that I feel entitled to it, 
but the fact that there were three sons and two were, uh, my, my uh, uh, youngest brother, the sociopath, graduated from USC at 21, came back to Toledo, and my father bought him a 4,000 square foot house. Mm -hmm. The neighbors in the neighborhood were in their 30s and 40s, and he was 21, and him and his wife decorated this massive house with uh, cement blocks and boards. <laughs> it looked like a dormitory, but they had this huge house. So, um, so someone had asked me, you know, with the, with the way my father treated me, uh, did he in any way ever redeem himself? And I said, yes, he did redeem himself. He passed away and left me a shitload of money. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I want to say is that my father his ego was so big, but he had an amazing sense of humor. And one thing he uh, uh, told me that will stick with me forever, he said, you know, I was the funniest one in the camps. Aww. And I said, that's a tough crowd. <laughs>